Yes, we can. Uh, when does it start? Five after, right? That's the it's, official start uh, time? No, I think it's 10 o'clock. It's 10 or 1. I think 10 o'clock is done. Okay. All right. So my name's Lee Jones. I'm the ST Ericsson landing team lead. Um, my main job, uh, or my team's main job, is to upstream as much of ST Ericsson's um, BSP code as possible. So I'd like to get a gauge for who's sitting in front of me now. Um, out of you, by a show of hands, can tell me that you're a maintainer or a regular contributor to upstream. One, two, three, four. Uh, who are the would-be upstreamers amongst you? So if your manager allowed you to do it, or if you had enough time in the day. Oh, no. yeah. Yeah. Who's here to find out what upstreaming is, or how to do it? Even better. And who are the people amongst us here who are against upstreaming? So it's not their company policy, or uh, they think it's a waste of time, or what have you. None of those people. Okay. So the topics we're going to briefly cover then. Uh, repository hierarchy, or repository hierarchy tree. Um, what is a maintainer, and how can they, uh, and, sorry, and what do they do? The benefits of upstreaming, and how to upstream your code. We're also going to cover very briefly uh, how long it takes to upstream your code. First thing we're going to cover is repository hierarchy. So the repository hierarchy is a theoretical hierarchy of repositories. It's one repository on top of another look, uh, looked after by uh, any particular maintainer in a hierarchical um, view. Many of them are Git maintained now, although I'm sure that there are one or two that still use archaic uh, versioning systems such as um, SVNs and uh, CVNs. Each repository specializes in one topic. There are 902 different topics or code slices throughout the, um, throughout the Linux kernel. Um, when I say one repository, that doesn't necessarily mean one repository to those of you, of you who are comfortable with it. It can mean uh, a different branch on a, on a repository. There is one maintainer per topic, um, and there are uh, 505 unique maintainers currently registered within the Linux kernel. So here's what the hierarchy looks like. At the very top, you've got mainline. That's looked after by Linus Torvalds. I'm sure we all know who he is. Underneath that, I've picked two areas which are of particular uh, interest to Lenara. So firstly, you have the architectures, and then we have driver subsystems. There are many more of these, but these are the two that we're going to, uh, I'm going to use in the example. So underneath mainline, directly underneath mainline, you have the architecture trees. Now, these are the people that are looked after by the Russell Kings of so uh, that's the ARM uh, repo in this particular case. You've also got things like Chris, uh, MIPS, SuperH, and x86-100. The Linux kernel currently supports 24 different architectures. Underneath architectures, you've got sub-architectures. Um, so these are, our, these are our four partners. So um, starting from left to right, you have Freescale, the nomadic um, architecture, which is ST Ericsson, Samsung, OMAP, um, and who knows, uh, we're currently in talks with bringing on other partners along. It could be your company. So on the other side then, we have uh, driver subsystems. So this is another route going from, uh, traveling from mainline. Underneath uh, driver subsystems, there are currently 90 supported. <coughs> the examples I've given are particularly short and fit in the boxes I've provided. <laughs> Um, underneath that, so a, a, a lower level down the tree to that, you have the more specific driver subsystems. So underneath ATA, ATA you, have some, uh, you have something called Promise, underneath Base you've got Power, underneath a DMA you've got IO and so on and so forth. Uh, I'll go into these in a little bit more detail. So what is upstreaming then? If you have a developer, for instance in, in my particular example it's, it's an SDE uh, developer, or someone like myself who works with SDE, and, they want, and we want to upstream our own code. We have to go through the hierarchy um, to, the very, uh, to the very top to mainline our code. So you have an STE, STE developer here. He has to then go through the nomadic uh, repo, which is uh, maintained by Linus Bollet. We have to go through the ARM repo, which is maintained by uh, Russell King, and to eventually end up in mainline. 
And that process is what we call upstream, moving your own code up to the Alpha 1 uh, ring. So who are maintainers? Briefly covered a couple of them, and what do they do? So a maintainer is a subsystem code owner. Here's a person that owns any particular slice within the Linux kernel. By, by code slice, it could mean um, a subsystem or any number of files or directories, so on and so forth. They act as gatekeepers. They're the people that are going to be accepting or rejecting patches that are submitted by the developers at the lowest levels. Every maintainer within the Linux kernel, except for Linux Torvalds, also have upstream responsibilities. So um, people will try and get their code into the lowest level maintainers uh, or the most niche maintainers, and then those maintainers take responsibility to keep um, upstreaming their code into the higher and higher level maintainers until it eventually reaches the learner store levels. So here's what the maintainer hierarchy looks like. You'll see that it's very similar to the repo hierarchy. So at the very top you've got your level 1 maintainers, that's only Linux Torvalds. Underneath that you have your level 2 maintainers, which are the uh, Greg KHs of the world and uh, the Russell Kings of the world. Underneath that you've got um, your level 3 maintainers, which is the Linux Wallays and all the people that we work with, with uh, within Venara. Then you have level 4 maintainers and this can keep going for uh, depending on how complex um, any particular code is or how niche um, um, uh, any particular file can be down the, down, the, uh, down the hierarchy. So here's how they all fit in there. So right at the top you've got your Alpha 1, your Level 1, which is uh, Linux Torvalds. Then you've got your Level 2 maintainers and your Level 3 maintainers, and this, the, the, and, and this tree can go on for as long as you like. And here they all are. Um, I am, um, I'm under good advice that actually uh, the x 861 is currently wrong and actually that's group maintained rather than any particular person. So, if you've got your, uh, to reiterate then, if you've got your developer who works for SD Ericsson, to upstream his code, he needs to traverse the tree up to the very uh, top point. Once it's at the top point, that, that code is then considered, considered mainlined or upstreamed. So if we look at some, some statistics, as I've mentioned earlier, there are 505 unique maintainers within the Linux kernel. There are 902 uh, subsystems, topics, code slices, call them what you will, um, currently registered within the Linux kernel. So if, that, if the developer right at the bottom of the tree wants to upstream his code, um, he needs to find out who he needs to first forward, uh, forward um, his code onto. Who is the lowest level maintainer that looks after the piece of code that he has changed? The answer is you have to look in Linux maintainers, or you can run across people. Um, the Linux maintainers file is a text file that contains a number of entries. This is one of those entries. I've picked Linus Wallet because he's the, he's the lowest level maintainer who I personally work with. Um, this gives you some relevant information. The M is not the maintainer, the M is mail to. So if you, if you touch this particular code area, code slice, subsystem, whatever you want to call it, you need to uh, mail all these people here. Uh, you also need to mail the, the mailing list, which is um, which is the lowest common mailing list for that particular code area. Um, the S is the current status of this particular uh, maintained area or code slice. Then you've got the files in which this particular code slice touches. And then finally you've got the, the, the lowest level git tree or the repo within that tree that this particular uh, code area touches. Just a, a comment on the maintainer's file. The maintainer's file is, is your starting point where you're looking for stuff. The data that is in here is not necessarily authoritative. It will give you guides on where to start. Uh, but if you have questions, these are the people to, this is the starting place to go and ask and find out, okay, who am I actually supposed to be emailing so that you, you're not completely off on your own to try and figure out what to do. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, next thing we're going to cover is the benefits of upstream. So what we're currently seeing is that um, even within our partners, um, a lot of management within inside those uh, need education and they insist that upstreaming is a waste of resources. They think that it's a waste of time and has no real benefit. And after all, time, uh, time in, most, uh, in most business areas um, equates to money. 
They also think it's a waste of engineering power. Um, they think that their engineers, once they're finished working on their piece of code, should work on the next piece of code, rather than spending that extra 5% trying to mainline their code. Now that's, gonna, that's probably, especially if they, if they start to reuse their code or use the same chips within their hardware, that's going to start costing them a lot of money. They also think that they're giving away work to competitors. Uh, but most of their competitors now are currently upstreaming their code, so this is really null and void. Uh, it actually helps out, so each company will spend less time on development because they can start using each other's code. So this, at the end of the day, they're saving money. So one of the first benefits that I'd like to cover is maintainability. Um, as soon as you upstream your code and it reaches the top level, um, you renounce responsibility. You're no longer responsible for that piece of code. The, um, a particular maintainer will then take that responsibility on. Albeit when there's changes, he'll probably ask you to change it, but if you say no, and there are a lot of people using that code, then he's going to have to use his resources to change it, and not himself. Don't tell him I said um, Next thing is uh, with regards to forward porting. Um, the Linux kernel moves at a fantastic rate and changes at, at, at an even larger rate. Um, the, the APIs are constantly changing, and if your, if your driver uses an old API, and then there's a big API change, um, the, the maintainer of that particular area, will, the chances are, will move that forward for you and make the corrections for you. So again, you renounce, um, you renounce the responsibility. Your code then becomes future-proof uh, future by upstream. So here's an example. You have a manager who's in charge of a crack team of um, software engineers. They create a fantastic piece of uh, sorry. They, I got that yet. they create a piece of software which goes into a product which is a big success. After the release of the product, the code is then shelved. After a period of time, uh, another senior manager comes along and says, "Look, that product was such a success. That's create another one." Um, after that, after a long period of time, the kernel has moved so far forward that your code will no longer work. Um, so it will either require a forward port which will cost money, or a complete rewrite, which, which will cost a lot of time and money. Next thing you get is, code, is quality assurance. Um, in the process of our street... There's another thing we, we discussed this earlier in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the oral, in the oral kernel sessions. Yeah. Um, when stuff goes upstream and we we see that all the time that the IP blocks are not that different, which are used in the... Because there are not that many IP vendors out there. Yeah, so, you're right, yeah. So the, the chance that something which is very similar to your IP block you have to write a, a driver for is already in the kernel. Yeah. is rather high. Well, that's where you step in, isn't it? Pardon? That's where you step in, isn't it? Yes. So, and, and if stuff doesn't get upstream, then you have five incarnations of the same driver for the same IP block all exactly. over the place and nobody, nobody's looking at it and you can't share resources. And so in the long run, having stuff consolidated, not only upstream, also consolidated upstream is a benefit for all players because for the, your next project where you reuse IP blocks or just a different variant of the same IP block. You yeah. have a decent chance to save a lot of time. Yeah. And that's what, what, what and, really and is. And some managers within companies refuse to upstream because they don't want to share their code. But as you say, it's, it, it's ridiculous. Um, and even worse, when two IP blocks do enter the kernel and are, are similar, it's then that you've then got code wastage and things like that. But <coughs> um, when two IP bo blocks are upstream, and they're very, very similar, but they're in separate sub-architectures, you then get code wastage and things like that. Yes. So that's what we are tackling right now. Exactly. We're moving drivers to the place where they belong, and there we see the, the, the commonality and can fix that up. Thank you. Um, so within the upstream process, if you, want, if you manage to get your code upstream, it would have been reviewed by at least one person. Now, that person isn't Joe Bloggs who sits next to you at work who happens to be the best programmer in the room, these are the best programmers in the world that are, going to, um, that are going to review your code. If they're not maintainers themselves, then they're going to be well-known reviewers and well-respected re uh, reviewers. This will ensure that the code is both uh, is, um, programmed correctly. It will ensure that you're using the correct APIs, you're not using uh, any hacky code or anything like that. 
The maintainers and the reviewers have seen many, co uh, many uh, code inclinations before, and they're going to know what works best on any particular system. So this is going to ensure, to, <coughs> as much as you can, that, this code, that your code is going to be optimised as much as possible. You're not, you haven't written 3,000 lines of code that can actually be, um, you can actually use some API and actually do that in only. Um, I did put bug free, but the Linux kernel is never going to be bug free. Um, it's just so massive. But um, many of the maintainers and the reviewers would have seen many of the bugs that your, your, uh, your code would potentially introduce before. Um, they can then iron those out, tell you that this could perhaps be a problem, and you can rewrite it to try and iron out those as much as possible. You get testing and validation on a, on a massive scale. When you upstream your code into the main line, and then any company takes the main line tree, they're going to be using your code. If they're using the same hardware, they're going to be using your code. This is particularly pre prevalent in uh, common code. If you make a change to common code, thousands of people are going to Millions of people are going to be using your code every single day. If there's a problem with it, people will let you know. You get direct user feedback via this process. Um, this can either happen in, uh, you can actually get these from bug reports, or people will actually scan the code, find out who wrote a particular block, um, and contact you directly. If not, if they know how to use Git, they can use the Git logs or Git blame to find out who wrote a particular file or a particular line in any, uh, uh, in any file. And they'll contact you and say, look, there's a problem here, would you mind correcting it? And this goes back to the responsibility thing as well. If it's affecting somebody, then if you're too busy to, uh, to change it, you say, um, actually, I haven't got time to fix this at the moment. And the chances are, if they're any good, they'll fix it themselves, or they'll get someone else to fix it. So you save them time at the end of the day. So how, how do you upstream your code? This presentation um, involved a, uh, a tutorial on how you should upstream your code, but it, it, it went on for far too long. I'm uh, probably boring already. Um, <clears throat> I've ripped most of that out, but we're going to make the, uh, the original presentation available. So if you are here to find out what upstreaming is and how to do it, then please download that, and it will be more of a tutorial for you than, than this is. Firstly, prepare your code. Um, when you plan it, and um, there's bits that you don't know, there's holes that you need to fill. Ask the mailing list. They're not only there to forward patches, they're there to provide advice. Uh, and if you write your question in an eloquent manner, uh, and you're polite, and you seem knowledgeable, you seem like you want to learn, people will want to help you. They will reply to your email, and they will give you nice, sensible, eloquent answers. Um, all for the code. But before you do, please read the documentation. Have a look through Linux documentation. There's loads of stuff there which will cover the, the processes that you're going to use, the APIs that you're going to come across, and the, and the styles and advice um, are there too. So read coding style, it will tell you how you need to start to author your patch. Then create the patches. You can either do this by, uh, if you're using archaic versions or um, you've downloaded the tarball, you've made a change that you want to see upstream, you can use diff. I suggest you use git format patch, however. Um, to be a good kernel engineer, I, I really strongly feel like you should uh, learn git and become very, very um, apt with git. Um, create your patches as logical groups of functionality. Don't be tempted just because all these different files are in one particular directory to group them all together, because the chances are um, that particular commit won't compile without the next commit in the tree. So each commit has to be individually com uh, uh, compilable. If a revert happens, because a large chunk of code above you needs a revert, and they've reverted back to one of your commits, that commit, doesn't matter where it is in your pack set, has to be able to compile um, separately. Um, keep upstreaming um, going in with small patches, so small uh, patch sets and pulls uh, and small uh, patches, um, and keep upstreaming them offer, uh, often. Sorry, This will help you in uh, multiple ways. Firstly, they're easy to understand and review. No one really likes to review massive patch sets or massive patches. People like to review small stuff that they can understand easily and see if, see if it works. So split your code up into smaller blocks if that's at all possible. Um, it makes the, uh, oh, if, uh, if someone comes back to you and rejects your patch, 
um, it makes the changes very much easier. So if someone re rejects an entire driver, you've then got to rewrite that I entire driver. Or if not rewrite it, then make a change and submit the entire driver. If you're doing it patch by patch or small patch set by small patch set, you can make the amendments and then resubmit. This also identifies fundamental, uh, fundamental problems very, very early. So um, if you've started using the wrong APIs or, or, or dated APIs, um, you'll be told um, about that very, very soon. If you've written an entire driver based on old APIs and try and upstream and they say you need to change that, that's an entire rewrite then. That will cost you so much, uh, that will cost you a lot of money and time. Ensure you go through the review process. Um, firstly, ensure that your patches compile on the latest kernel. The amount of times I see Greg Cage uh, replying and saying this doesn't compile on my kernel is it starts to get a little bit silly. Um, if you're upstreaming, it needs to be your code needs to work on the on the highest level um, repo. Use that repo, compile against that repo, then send your patches. Test the functionality. Just because it compiles correctly, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work. Run it on your hardware, run it on the boards, ensure that your change or your, um, your new functionality works the way that you want it to work before you upstream it. Um, run check patch on it. This will ensure that there are no uh, white space errors and your, none of your code goes over the, uh, the 80 character boundary, things like that, and lots of other things in between. Send them to your internal mailing list first. You might have some local experts which can help you before you uh, finally reach the public domain. Once you've reached the public domain and you're still making um, amateurish uh, errors and you're continually being told about fixing your amateurish errors which local people could help you with, then people will be less inclined to want to help you. Um, once complete, add your signed off by. It won't be accepted upstream unless you've signed it off yourself. And if, unless you're, um, and don't sign it off if you're not confident, if you're not comfortable, confident with your own code, and then don't upstream. Uh, so then submit it. So before you submit, read this, read these pieces of documentation: submit checklist and submitting patches. They will tell you about all the common pitfalls that people come come across, uh, and and how to rectify them. And you can. If you rectify 90% of your own issues, you're only burdening the uh, mailing list with 10%. Then you need to locate the email destination. I've briefly covered Linux maintainers. Please have a look through there. Find out who was supposed to be maintaining it last. Ask them questions. Then run git maintainer. That will churn out information such as, here we go, the maintainer's emailing list and the, um, uh, and the mailing list addresses that you need to forward your patches onto. Um, also, don't forget to include any interested, interested parties. So if you've, if you've made a version 1 um, patch set, then, uh, and someone's commented on that, they're obviously interested in what you're, what you're doing. They might have some in interesting information for your version 2. So don't forget to CC them, because they might miss it on the mailing list the next time, and you might miss out on valuable information. Uh, lastly, always CC the, uh, the LK <coughs> and there's the address there. So sending your patches then. I suggest you use git send email. It, it irons out a lot of the problems that we see with regards to uh, email client specific stuff. You can use your email client, by all means, go ahead. If you do, um, then uh, ensure that you read this text file first. There are a lot of default settings and a lot of email clients which don't really match up very well with the way um, maintainers and reviewers like to see patches. Would you, would you suggest to send the email to yourself first and see whether you can apply Absolutely, the Absolutely, yeah. yeah, I do. <laughs> and that's what I do every time. So um, I use get, get send email, but send it to myself uh, the very first time and nobody else. That way I can see how it's going to, how it's going to appear on the mailing list and I can often identify um, some of the problems occur to you as well. Um, okay, so you can either uh, send patches via a single patch or a patch set. If you send them a, uh, a single patch, this, these are the way that you'll, you'll find them on the mailing lists. So you've got, I'm not saying that this description is fantastic, so don't use this as an example, but um, a good one line short description of what the patch um, is going to do, but right at the, uh, prepended on the subject with, within square brackets, uppercase the word patch. Both um, reviewers and maintainers then know that you're trying to upstream code, and it's also used for um, mailing list parsers. This is a patch set. So <coughs> patch sets 
Um, even if you don't really care about the order, um, please place them in order. As I said, um, no lower commit should rely on an upper level commit, so they have to be ordered. So order that within these square brackets. Um, within, when you upstream in patch set, you also add a, uh, a zero of three. That will give a, a better description of what the entire patch set is trying to do. Um, this, this won't find its way into the history. This is more for the reviewers and um, to try and get an idea of exactly what this is trying to accomplish. Dealing with the mailing lists then. This can be an art in itself. You may, you may be the uh, your best kernel engineer in the world, but be harsh and abrupt and uh, people won't want to listen to you. Um, first of all, be patient. The mailing lists are extremely busy. Um, your patch may not be reviewed the first day or the first hour that you place it up. It might take a good few days or a week or so. Um, bear, bear, uh, bear with it. Um, after a couple of weeks or a week or so, if, if no one said anything, and but you need this patch reviewed, give them a nudge. But don't send them emails every hour saying you still have nothing to do, because they'll just delete it or be more inclined to ignore it. Be polite and don't take offence by what people say. Some maintainers are uh, well known to be very hard to work with. Uh, they're straight talking, non-diplomatic. They're, um, they're very busy people. They have uh, very little time on their hands uh, to be to fluff out emails and say, "Oh yeah, you did this wonderfully." But they'll just come along, chop your email up, and say, uh, uh, chop your patch up and say, "This is wrong because of this. This wrong. This is wrong because of this." And then probably give you a bit of a hard time as well. So what? Well, Trade off. Explain your reasons for decisions. Maintainers aren't always right. Normally, don't get me wrong, they're, they, they're fairly correct, but they might have the wrong end of the stick of what it is you're trying to do. Especially if you've spoken to another maintainer who actually says, you know, this is a good idea because of this, that and the other, or you've taken heed of advice prior. Link that email, or, uh, or say, actually, this person said this because of this, and I'm trying to, you know, explain what it is you're trying to do. Um, and if they say, no, it's still not correct, then you need to go away and probably make some changes. If you don't understand us, he who asks a question is a fool for a minute. He who does not remains a fool forever. Uh, one thing uh, I noticed uh, the, you you're totally right. There are maintainers who are hard to work with. They are not always polite. But uh, most of them actually are polite when they start reviewing a patch. Yeah. When they start to be really grumpy if they explained, oh, you shouldn't do that because A, B, C. And then the person runs away and posts a patch which actually ignores that again. So that's the way you really can people can make people upset because they, you're wasting their time. So another thing is what maintainers often do is you uh, something like you might look into X. There is something similar. Look how it's done and do it and and. Look whether it applies to your problem as well, it might. So then people go away and rewrite the whole code so it looked like X, even if it gets worse than it was before. So this is the kind of thing you should never do because that really makes maintainers grumpy. So then, yeah, then those people are uh, viewed as those grumpy old forts on the <laughs> Linux curl mailing list. I'm one of them. And, uh, I wasn't going to say anything, Thomas. I wasn't going to name any names. <coughs> you can do that. I'm well aware of it. But <laughs> usually, usually I help out people and try to, to work with them. But when I have the feeling that I'm wasting my time, then and, and time is really limited. So the bandwidth we are having, the high volume we are, the maintainers are having for review, is extremely limited. Yeah, I agree. And so we rather work with people where we get good feedback than wasting our time on reviewing the same crap over and over and people not listening. Yeah. I mean, we, I'm perfectly fine saying, yes, I was wrong in public, so there's enough evidence I was out there. So I don't mind having a good technical discussion about the problem and then step back and say, yes, you're right, but you have to do it this, this way because it doesn't fit. That's not a, not a deal. Most maintainers can do that. Yeah. But Getting, getting a no reaction, that's what, what, what really eats up the, 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 the thing. And up to the point where many kind of simply say, yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely need to take heed of what they're saying. I'm gonna try not, try, that's another thing, try not to pee off maintainers. 
Uh, okay, so getting flamed. Um, Christoph said my code is buggy, my office smells and my hair looks strange. He said it on Linux, uh, uh, Linux kernel and everybody saw it. Um, first of all, congratulations. You've just managed to gain the attention of one of the best programmers in the world. Um, take all those comments out, throw them away, ignore them. In between each one of those comments, there was probably a reason why your code was buggy. Um, probably a good reason for it. So take his advice, take heed, go and rewrite the patch, and then resubmit and forget uh, that he ever said your hair looks strange. And then perhaps go and get a haircut. <laughs> 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 then make your changes and resubmit. Um, your patches, unless you're very, very good at this, and are, um, no, even if you're very, very good at this, I'll take that back, uh, even maintainers, by, via uh, higher level maintainers, get code chucked back at them and say, look, you need to change this, you need to change this. The maintainer I work with, Linus Wallet, well, is an excellent kernel engineer, but people do, people do make mistakes, and he does get picked up on things, but he just goes away, makes the change, and then... Um, Streams again. No bigger. He doesn't get discouraged and neither should you. Here are some typical reasons for change requests. You'll find this in the documentation that I've mentioned before, so I'm not going to elaborate on that anymore. If you want to use this as more of a tutorial, then please go back and um, find that. So, how long does upstreaming normally take? <coughs> the real answer is how long is a piece of stream? But there are various factors which will either lengthen or shorten the, uh, the upstreaming process. The first one is if you get your code correct the first time, then obviously the, um, the upstreaming process can be very, very short. If you've got to make corrections and uh, there's a lot to be changed, then obviously that's going to that's take some time. If the complexity of the change is um, at an extremely high level, you need to go away and read some documentation or find out how another sub-architecture works or use, or someone said, like Thomas said, someone said this is very similar, why don't you use this as an example kind of thing. It's going to take a little bit longer. The merge window can also make a massive difference. For those of you who don't know what a merge window is, here are some stats about it. It lasts about eight, uh, eight to ten weeks and is open for about two weeks. So what happens is, uh, within the kernel release cycle, a kernel is released. We'll say, we'll say 2638 is released. So then the 2639 merge window will open for two weeks. Within that two weeks, all new functionality will be pulled from the level two maintainers into mainline by Linux. After the merge window has closed, no new functionality will enter until the next merge window. Um, release candidate 1 will open, and that will be a very buggy, probably won't even compile kernel. After succession through um, the release candidates, the, the kernel will get better and better, and eventually by RC8, the kernel will be fully compilable and almost fully working. After RC8, the next, uh, the next release will be released, so we'll say 2639. Then the 2640 uh, merge window will open, and so on and so forth. Right? Does that make sense? Please. This is. Are you going to talk about Linux next? No. Okay. We need to talk about Linux next. This isn't entirely true when you're talking about upstream code and what you need to be targeting for. Yes, this is what we work with, and this is the the, the development cycle that the Linux kernel releases work on. That merge window. When that merge window opens. This is the time for Linus and the maintainers that he deals with to talk back and forth. When you're getting stuff upstreamed, what your goal has to be is not to get your stuff into the merge window, but to get your stuff out onto the main list three or four weeks before the merge window, yeah. because that's the time that the maintainers are going to be looking at stuff and deciding what to pick up and put into their trees. And then what goes into their trees, there's an integration tree called Linux Next. Now Linux Next is a nightly is a tree that's re rebuilt every single day. Well, every weekday that Stephen Roth, uh, Rothfeld is working. Uh, he maintains Linux Next, and what he does is he takes all the sub-maintainer trees and he does a trial integration. And then he builds it and he releases it after testing and booting on some hardware. So your goal as a Linux developer who wants to upstream your code, is to get your code into your sub, sub maintainers tree, which will go into Linux next, and will get some of that initial <coughs> integration testing before Linux even looks at it. Then, when the merge window opens, in fact, the merge window isn't nearly the chaotic time that it used to be, because most of these patches have already been tested, they've already 
they already work. And it actually, we've got fairly nice RC ones now that can pile yeah. and work on real hardware. Like, that's certainly better than they used to be, I agree. It's a lot better. And Linux Next has made all the different <coughs> roles. So your target is Linux Next. And remember that. Once you're in Linux Next, there's a good chance you're going to just go into mainline. And if there's problems caught in Linux Next, you'll know about it early before you get an angry email from Linux saying, you broke my kernel. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> so, um, just to re-emphasize, really, um, in fact, this is null and void of what you just said. Um, for your, it's not really actually, um, for your, once your code reaches the level two uh, maintainer level, um, you're then waiting uh, for the merge window open before you actually uh, appear in um, Linux mainline. That's kind of the point I was trying to make. Um, also, the depth of the maintainer hierarchy, uh, where you actually enter. So, um, here's the maintainer hierarchy again. Uh, if, you, if you're issuing code at the very, very bottom level, say even the level six of the maintainer hierarchy tree, your, your patches have then got to go through um, four different upstreaming, um, whatever you want to call it, I can't think of the word right now. There are patches sitting at each one of these, and there is, each maintainer will have its own queue. So um, the patches would have to go through the, the, the fourth level maintainer, the third level maintainer, and the lower down that, uh, that tree you went, obviously, the, the longer it's going to take for your code to finally reach main line. But the percolation from a maintainer upstream to the, to the, to the, the second tier is usually way faster than what it takes to review them. And, and integrate the patches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, that's the first, to, to get your patch within the first maintainer's tree will take the longest amount of time. After that, the process does to speed up. It uh, does speed up. That's due to Git because we are very effective now with uh, aggregating stuff in one tree, then sending pull requests to the next level maintainer. Right. And um, Linus had a very strict policy policy about merges earlier in. When we started working with Git, he didn't want to see merges, but then he noticed that it holds up the process a lot. So, so he's he uh, loosened the rules on that, so we can actually uh, push things up up into Linux Next very fast. Yeah, yeah. In fact, if you, if you go back the slide, mm. uh, what you'll see, and that you don't need to. You know, this is some extra information. You don't need to worry too much about this. But we'll have situations where two subsystems will depend on the same code. And in that case, the subsystem maintainers will talk and they'll go, okay, well, here's this base set of patches that we both depend on. We'll both pull that in. It's the same commits. Git does this. It takes care of all this stuff for us. Uh, so it all shows up as one commit in mainline, but two subsystems maintainers can have the same code in their tree yeah, and break this up normally. And that's actually something you should be aware about. If you trip over something which is uh, has a shortcoming in some infrastructure, in some generic code, don't do be afraid. Not wait, work around that shortcoming in your code. Don't That's be afraid. That's going to yeah. be fired back. So what the right thing is, is talk to the relevant maintainer, even if it's a totally different subsystem, and then it gets fixed in the in the generic infrastructure, or you send a patch against the generic infrastructure, now we have the problem that your code depends on it. Uh, we solve it that way. I take, for example, if it's timers or interrupts or whatever, I take the change separated into a separate project git and ask the other system maintainer where your larger patch goes in to just pull it. Mm -hmm. So then it doesn't matter whether I move that patch first into Linux 3 during the merge window or the other guy because it's the same commit and it just doesn't show up yeah. in, this, in the... This is probably a little bit more in-depth and complex yeah. than I intended but, to uh, Yeah, but, to but one, of the most, one of the problems we see, especially in ARM, is that people are reluctant to, to, to do modifications to the frameworks for whatever reason. There are various it's reasons. It's quite a lot of work. No. Actually, what, what happens if you talk to those guys and not work around, I just recently had a patch uh, where I saw it and, and said, no, you don't want to do that. 
I did it in a cool code for you in three lines, and it removed 500 plus lines from the driver. Yeah, right. yeah. So that's, that's the point I was trying to make. One of the reasons is a lot of people who are new to that came, came over from other operating systems where it's the only way to do it. Mm -hmm. Because if you look into a, a black box, mm -hmm. proprietary, Operating system where you may look into the code, but you can have don't have a chance to modify the code. Then the only thing you can do is work around in your driver. Yeah. So people should learn that working around in the driver is almost always the, the wrong approach. Yeah, there's a documentation. There's a document in the documentation directory called uh, Stable API non API nonsense. One of the things that internal to the kernel for a very purposeful reason, we don't have a stable API. Because core internal kernel stuff, we want to change, we want to fix bugs. We want to adjust the APIs as need be. External, you know, the user space interface, that's locked down. But internal, if you need to change something, send a patch to propose it. Can you um, forward me uh, which document that is and I'll make sure that it ends up on the... Yes. Stable API nonsense.txt. Yeah, I think I'll we're running out of time. I'll, I'll put, put it on here and move on. If we could, that'd be appreciated. So, um, the final factor that you need to take into consideration is uh, how you're perceived on the mailing list. If um, you've either been very rude, or as Thomas says, you've not heeded any information that was given to you, then people are going to be less inclined to want to help you, and your patches are going to be sitting on the mailing list for that much longer awaiting review. Whoops. Might as well bring it all up then. So, to conclude then, uh, proprietary code is always worth upstreaming. The benefits far outweigh the, uh, the cons that were mentioned earlier that were, uh, and the beliefs um, by, the, um, by normal, normally middle management we have the problems with. Um, upstream your code little and often. Um, this aids in constant world-class reviews. It avoids large rewrites uh, re and uh, that enjoy the process should be there. Act professional and knowledgeable on the mailing list. Make people want to help you. And finally, enjoy the process. Does anybody have any questions? I believe we have two minutes. So how does Linux kernel fit into this area? How does it fit in? It's kind of not in the... It's, it's a... Right, yeah. So first of all, we've got mainline, and then ARM. Um, so Lenaro would fit on the same level as a sub-architecture. In fact, it, it normally fits, yeah, yeah, on the same level as sub-architecture. So um, when I or someone else forwards a, uh, a patch to the nomadic um, tree, that will then be copied over to Lenaro, so it will support the same code. It also acts as more of a a Linux Next as well. So uh, Nico will take in patches that aren't yet upstreamed. So it's kind of a what will the Linux kernel look like in, um, in X amount of months once this particular functionality reaches. So uh, Nico takes in uh, all of the patches from our four partners, so uh, Freescale, ST Ericsson, Samsung and TI, um, and encompass all those patches in there as well. So it's um, it's uh, Linux's mainline kernel plus all of the patches from those partners that haven't yet made it up into mainline. Does that answer your question? Are there any more? Please. Who is the light you know, main, maintainer if the patch set is below to you know? Who is the maintainer? Yeah. Sorry? Who is the light maintainer if the patch set is below to you know, different subset? I don't, I don't really understand the question. If, you, if you've written a piece of code, that, that touches many um, directories or um, source files, you can have a look for those directories and source files within the maintainer's um, uh, text file or you can run uh, get, ma uh, get maintainer and that will tell you who each of the maintainers are that your code has touched. So does that mean you know, the, the, the lower level of you know, the maintainer has to contact each of the maintainer for the you know, for the same, same solution? Usually, what, I, I, I think I know what he means. So you, so you have a patch which changes infrastructure, which, which then has to fix up a lot of yeah, uses like of the infrastructure. 
so that the, the, the things you usually post to change to the infrastructure, to the maintenance of the subsystem, then have the fix-ups. If it's just a little bit, no, there's no need to, to, uh, to CC any, every of the file maintainers. That's, that's only relevant when you have broader intrusive semantic changes. So, but if you just uh, add some flag thing which has to be fixed in, in, in all those implementations, it's basically not that's, a change. That's probably the job of the high level maintainers. Yes. Yeah. So if you if you make a change that only that affects one particular area, mm -hmm. then um, it will be the high level maintainer's role mm -hmm. to tell all of his subordinate uh, maintainers that there has been this change, and they should make that. That's kind of the API changes. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll follow up on that. If you're making incompatible changes, you change something, you change it at a function call, and it breaks all the other drivers, your patch isn't going to get accepted. You no, you have, to fix, you have to fix it up. You fix them too. But, yeah. but there's but, no need to CC everyone in the hell uh, uh, on that, because usually the, the, these API changes should be discussed before you do that. So, so you say, here's my problem, here's, my, here's my, the shortcoming I detected. Here is my proposed solution to, to change the interface. And then when the, the, the relevant maintainer says, OK, go ahead, then you send the patch series which changes the interface and fixes up all the users. So that's what, I, that's what I said about responsibility as well. So um, once you've uploaded your code, it's not your responsibility to make all the API changes. They'll be done, they'll be done for you. So you can. Whereas if you kept that piece of code that's had this API change in your own file system rotting away, then it is your responsibility to change that because your code will no longer work with that. Right. Quick question. If you have, if you pushed a patch upstream for a certain driver and then uh, the kernel moves to the next one or two versions and, and the API changes or something. And then, the, then the person who changes the API has the responsibility to fix it. Exactly. So we we now have tools and, 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 and things where we can do rather large scale API fix ups across the tree, totally scripted. So, Cochinelle, that's a semantic capture. We use it a lot for this kind of work. So, we had a, I think the largest thing was, what was ever done was uh, adding a, an argument to one of the memory allocator things. So we just added an argument to the, to the function and we fixed up every caller of that function in the tree by setting the argument to some uh, default thing. So that's, if you change anything on an, AB, on, a, on an interface in the kernel, then the guy who changes it needs to fix the fallout. Yeah, I agree. So there are two ways how we do that. One is either if it's not possible to do a full rock rollover in one go, then we usually provide a new interface, deprecate the old one, and ask people to, fit, to, to help us fixing it. Or if that's not, going, not happening, then after a grace period, we just fix it and break stuff. So, so it's twofold. So if, if people do not, if we talk to people and say, here, we changed this interface, we can't do it full force right now for various reasons, but please look at your code, do the necessary changes yourself, uh, and then if this doesn't happen for six months, then we just break it. So that's, so the don't break it rule is not always true, but most of the time. There are no hard rules. No. There, there's really strong guidelines, but sometimes we just have to move forward. Yes, that would happen in the in the last merge window with, with the with the generic interrupt infrastructure where I had to remove all the old interface old interfaces and people were ignoring me for years. So I just went through and fixed them all. I mean, I broke a few. Is there any final questions before we? Uh, if you do have any more questions, feel free to uh, email me. As I said before, my name's Lee Jones. Lee yeah. uh, Lee dot Jones at Lenaro to or catch one of the upstream maintainers who yeah. are hanging out here. Yeah. Even better, yeah. I, yeah. Oh, what, what, 
Uh, they will be. We're going to make a, uh, oh, the yes. video is going to be online. In the uh, states, a lot of editing and uh, um, the the uh, probably both sets. So this set will be online, and the set that goes into a lot more detail will be online as well. All right. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.